today I want to talk about the important book by F. William Engdahl, Full Spectrum Dominance, and why this is a must-read book. But I also want to point out that it ties in perfectly with the book Grand Chessboard by Zbigniew Brzezinski that I said we would get to next. You know, last week we did Brzezinski discussing the technocratic era in between two ages. And this time I want to talk about what the notion of full spectrum dominance is and why it's so important. And this book is a necessary read. Everybody should read this. It's not even that long. But back in 2008, I think it's, it's fascinating to me that Ingdahl was laying out everything that we're reading in the news today. So if you remember 2008, there was the Georgia Ossetia provocation. And this was reported in the news by lying CNN as if this was uh, Russia provoking the West, when in fact it was the other way around. The Rose Revolution uh, is the color revolution that was appointed for Georgia. And we've seen a whole string of these. And in fact, uh, Ingdahl hit me to something that I had suspected for a long time. I knew that the Dalai Lama was a CIA asset, but I didn't know that the, if you remember the Free Tibet stuff that was popular in the 90s, you know, I remember going into music stores and you would see like Nirvana posters, Pearl Jam posters, and then Free Tibet. This even comes up in uh, Twin Peaks with uh, Agent Cooper being a big devotee of uh, Tibetan Buddhism and the freeing of Tibet. Well, that was actually a color revolution that was funded by the CIA. It was part of the Gene Sharp democratic revolution uh, idea that we've talked about many times. And this is where we get the idea of color revolutions from. So that was actually the, the Saffron Revolution of Myanmar, which had a lot of neoconservative geopolitical oil and strategic interests behind it. So there's a great uh, chapter that Ingdahl deals with in terms of the Dalai Lama. And this goes all the way back, of course, to the Dalai Lama being in bed with uh, the National Socialists in Germany, which a lot of people on the right will try to read that as some affinity uh, between traditional Buddhism and the alt-right or something like this. No, that's all CIA machinations. There's not a traditional uh, Tibetan Buddhism that you're somehow going to link up with that's going to give you some edge uh, in terms of ancient paganism or something like that. And that's dealt with in a very geostrategic way, a very philosophical way, uh, in Ingdahl's book. Now, next I want to talk about how all of this that we see in terms of the color revolutions and their strategies Ingdahl mentions that this goes back to the 60s and the Rand Corporation studying the swarming techniques that they were pioneering at that time from game theory and so forth. And in particular, the 60s student riots in France. There was the uh, radical Situationist International, which is a kind of anarchic cultural Marxist uh, group that was involved in provoking uh, the 60s student riots in France comparable to the 60s student riots in the U.S., but what this did was is, is it allowed the Rand Corporation to study mobs and swarming techniques that actually come from bees. Yes, bees and flies and Beelzebub. And if you study the technique of swarming, you could use that as a kind of warfare uh, pattern and strategy, not for necessarily fighting on the battlefield per se. That might have to tie into drone warfare in the future or something, but more so nonviolent techniques of regime change, coup change, culture change. That's what uh, Gene Sharp, the professor, pioneered uh, at his Albert Einstein Institute. Now this was all studied also in connection with the Tavistock and Rand Corporation studies of rock music, believe it or not, because it's, it's crowd psychology. So he goes into that, which is, I thought was very good. But the real issue here in terms of geopolitics in relationship to Brzezinski is the following the model that Brzezinski laid out where you cannot allow Russia uh, to have any kind of link with China or with Germany. These are the two forces that have to be uh, neutralized or destroyed through prolonged war. And that's actually what Quigley says in Tragedy and Hope was the goal of World War I and World War II, was the weakening of Germany and then the weakening uh, of all of the Axis powers uh, in any kind of alliance with Germany. And then in the Cold War, it was with the Bolsheviks and all that, that was the weakening of Russia as any kind of threat to the Anglo-American uh, Zionist establishment. And that's exactly what happened throughout these wars and in, into the Cold Wars where, as well. So the War on Terror is just the updated version of that. And because it is 
uh, amorphous and unknown, it can be placed anywhere. You can say that there's terror groups anywhere, there's oppressive governments everywhere, tyrants everywhere. But you'll notice, of course, the logic of it is completely irrational. Kim Jong-un, you know, why, why are we only going after select supposed dem democratic tyrants, right? We're, we're, not, we're going after Saddam, uh, but that's all pre-planned in decades of uh, neoconservative uh, PNAC type stuff. Uh, back into the 80s with the Oded and Yanan plan. So uh, we real, we're starting to realize, I think, uh, a lot of people that, that what we're sold in these wars is all done through PR and they're planned decades ahead of time. And they're, they're brought about, they're prepped through all of these NGOs, Open Society, National uh, <clears throat> Endowment for Democracy. And Soros, Brzezinski, all these characters are always tied into these big level think tanks that are planning these nonviolent, quote unquote, soft power, soft coup revolutions. And then once you hype that up for a long enough time, you can then in initiate the actual regime change if it needs to happen. That's in fact what they're trying so to do. Characters like Andrew Marshall, characters like Robert Zolek, a lot of these big neocon characters, that they're behind the scenes crafting these new strategies and techniques. In 2001, 9-11, that was actually a big part of moving us into the model of how to use these RAND corporations swarming techniques in all these other countries. Now it had been done before as I said but what happens is that the war on terror is the means by which the transition phase by which you can start to export this specific strategy everywhere across the globe as the means of controlling uh, rebel rogue nations as they're supposedly called. But actually what happens is that the rogue nations are just basically guys who most likely had to deal with the CIA from a long time ago and then they've reached their expiration date and maybe they don't want to lose power maybe they don't they're not ready to give up yet uh, so they're like old milk the religious manipulation is a big part of this and that's what Brzezinski mentioned in one of the key chapters in between two ages was utilizing big religious groups Roman Catholicism post Vatican II especially the Dalai Lama these kinds of uh, religious figures can be drafted into the human rights complex, human rights industrial complex. And so I just thought that, that all of that is outlined in such amazing foresight and detail in terms of 2008, uh, all the way into in the last chapter explaining the role of Hollywood uh, in promoting the war on terror. And you think back to the 1990s, like 1994, was the year that we saw True Lies, the big James Cameron blockbuster with Jamie Lee Curtis and Arnold Schwarzenegger. And it's really the first big mega blockbuster to have the Arab terrorist narrative. Now there were a couple films prior to that that kind of hinted at that. And I know that there's a lot of predictive programming around the imagery and symbolism of 9-11. But for the first big blockbuster for the war on terror, I think we have to look at True Lies. Uh, and I'll be doing some analysis of that eventually. But definitely pick up a copy of Full Spectrum Dominus because what the book outlines is what you see and things that we talk about. We hear about the PNAC documents and all that of the neocons prior to 9-11. But what we learn is that the PNAC document is actually a, an explication of the philosophy of Full Spectrum Dominus, which has uh, been around for a long time, going back to the Rand Corporation and older imperial geopolitics for sure. But this is now an updated version where the idea is total surveillance, uh, total control through social media, mass media, uh, control of the psychiatric educational institutes, uh, control of religious institutions, control of sea, land, and air, which includes not just the weaponization and military techniques and strategies, but also the control of the resources. And that's really what this is about, is the, the neoliberal assault of controlling and privatizing all resources on the planet. Uh, and that's what is the modus operandi of the Trotskyite neoconservatives who basically are running and destroying the planet. So you've been listening to my, my breakdown and recommendation of Full Spectrum Dominance. My name is Jay Dyer from jaysanalysis.com. Go to the site, you can get my books, uh, signed copies. You can also subscribe to the full content where you'll see a lot of lectures and interviews and you can get access to the full talk of this subject matter.